Well, thank you, Holden and uh, and Buck. Uh, I don't see Buck, but thank you, Buck, for inviting me. Uh, I wish I could be there. Uh, I uh, I love it at at uh, at uh, at UNC, and uh, I've. I've been I've been there many times, and uh, I'm sorry I can't be there because of my other duties here. But uh, it's a real privilege to uh, get a chance to participate in this course. It's a very innovative course, and uh, we're very impressed here with what you're doing. Uh, we wish we had one um, here at Harvard. So um, what I'd like to do uh, in about uh, uh, you know 45 minutes or so <clears throat> is see if I can't. Uh, give all of you uh, sort of a way of thinking about strategy. A strategy is a word that <clears throat> gets used a lot. Um, it gets used almost, uh, you know, indiscriminately uh, to describe a lot of different things. Um, but I think at, at the core, we all sort of have the gestalt of strategy. Strategy is kind of the big picture of how the organization is going to win uh, in its environment, whatever that is. And um, uh, but yet, you know, what that really means and how to think about it is is actually still uh, uh, an issue that I find a lot of management teams of major companies struggle with. And um, so the, the my hope is that in a, a very short amount of time, we can talk about kind of some of the essential ideas of strategy. Uh, I'll be talking a lot uh, mostly about the uh, kind of for-profit world, but... Um, these ideas are equally uh, re applicable to any organization, any NGO, any nonprofit uh, that's actually serving a customer uh, in any way. Uh, and I do have a few slides at the end, which I may or may not have time to cover, which uh, actually give you the bridge between for-profit and nonprofit. Uh, so uh, I'd like to suggest that, that this way of thinking um, is ultimately going to have a profound impact on the success of any organization. Um, it's not the only thing that matters, as we'll see. Um, uh, you know, a good strategy poorly executed is not going to succeed. Uh, but, but ultimately, what we learn over and over again is just good execution rarely allows you to be truly superior and truly, uh, you know, change the world in, in whatever you're trying to do. You actually need to have a, a great strategic sense of, of how your organization is going to compete. And uh, so we'll, let's talk about that today. Um, the slides here that I'll show, uh, of course, we'll make available to you, um, and uh, we, with uh, with all, uh, uh, we'll, we'll also leave time for some Q and A at the end. And uh, I understand that uh, Buck has uh, some questions for you that he's going to ask you to uh, respond to uh, later on. So uh, I guess that's at least some modest incentive to uh, to pay attention even more than you ordinarily would. Um, so let's let's talk about strategy. Um, Let's talk about what we mean by a strategy. Let's talk about kind of the key ideas in strategy. And uh, I think the starting point for that is really to step quite far back and ask, you know, what is the fundamental sort of strategic challenge of any organization? And um, here, um, what I find is that, that many, many managers and, and leaders in organizations really start the whole process of thinking about strategy on the wrong, uh, on the wrong foot. Um, I think most most organizations, I think, when they under, try to understand what am I trying to do in my in my industry in my marketplace, they think that that their job is really to be the best organization in their industry, the best car company, the best retail bank, the best uh, maker of toothpaste. Um, um, and to be the best, we have to come up with the best product and the best service and the best supply chain and the best. Um, uh, customer support model. And if we can figure out in our organization how to be the best, how to, how to get it right in terms of all those key dimensions, we will ultimately win. Uh, that's the kind of thinking process that, that most organizations follow still to this day, uh, at least in my experience. And, and I'm very privileged. I get to work on strategy with you know, hundreds of organizations in every possible field uh, over, over the course of, of, a, of a year or two of my, uh, of my work. Um, now, what we've come to understand, I think, is that that is a very dangerous way of thinking about competition, and it's a very dangerous way of thinking about strategy. Um, indeed, there is no best company in any industry. That whole idea is, you know, kind of flawed from the very start. You know, what's the best car or the best car company? Well, it really all depends, doesn't it? It really depends on what needs that company is trying to serve. 
Uh, the, the best car to serve the uh, middle income uh, uh, person is not the best car to serve somebody living in an urban area with no parking space. And that's not the best car to serve, uh, uh, you know, other needs. Um, uh, you know, what's the best retail bank? Well, it all depends on who the customer is and, and what the customer's needs are. There's lots of different customers in virtually every business. And, uh, uh, and, and what we find is it's, it's impossible to be the best at serving every need of every customer. That is a fundamentally flawed way of thinking about what the job is of any organization. Uh, instead, uh, in thinking about strategy, really the starting point is not being the best. The starting point is thinking about how we can be unique, how an organization actually can create unique value for the customers it's seeking to serve. Um, that is the essential starting point for thinking about strategy. Um, if, if you're actually delivering unique value to the customer uh, you choose to serve, you will truly be able to win. Um, whereas if you're trying to be the best at, at sort of uh, competing in the industry, what that tends to lead to is kind of a zero-sum uh, competition where companies actually uh, ultimately uh, 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 start to do the same thing and ultimately uh, uh, are not able to succeed in the long run. So the, the fundamental question of strategy is really not about being the best, but it's about being uh, unique. Now, uh, you know, to take it one step further, um, you know, what strategy versus the other agendas of management? Um, well, a strategy is different than the goals. It's different than the aspirations. Uh, I, 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 but you, you'd be surprised how many management teams don't understand this. You know, I hear a lot of managers say, my strategy is to be the number one company in my industry. Um, my strategy is to, be, uh, to grow uh, faster than, than the market. Is that really a strategy? Well, no, that's actually a goal. That's actually an aspiration. Uh, it may be a good goal. It may be a, 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 a very exciting goal. But, but the strategy is not the goal. The strategy is how you're going to position yourself in the organization ultimately to hopefully achieve your goal. How do you get to be number one? How do you get to be number one or two or whatever, wh however you uh, describe your goals? How do you actually get there? What's unique about you? What gives you an advantage? Why would you be number one? Why would you be number two uh, in your industry? That's the strategy part. So we've got to clearly separate the strategy from the goal. We've also got to clearly separate the strategy from any particular action that you want to take uh, or think you should take. So, so for example, uh, you know, I hear a lot of managers say, well, my strategy is to internationalize my business. Well, you know, is that a strategy? Uh, well, not really. That, that's an action step. That's a, 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 an action you need to take uh, possibly to be successful. But it doesn't actually say what your unique advantage is. It doesn't really describe why you're going to win. It, it's just something you need to do as part of your journey to building out your organization. Um, uh, strategy is different from any individual action. Strategy is the position you seek to occupy uh, in the marketplace and the advantage on which you will compete. Um, and there's going to then be many, many action steps that have to be taken to get you there. Uh, but those action steps are not the strategy. The strategy is, the, is that core understanding of uh, your distinctive uh, position. Um, and uh, finally, a strategy is different than mission or vision. Uh, you know, a lot of organizations have mission statements, vision statements, describing their purpose as an organization, describing their aspirations for serving their customer and so forth. Um, but the mission and vision isn't strategy either. Um, mission and vision it tends to be motivational, it tends to be very broad, it tends to be very uh, inspirational, um, and, and those things are good in, in motivating an organization, creating a sense of purpose, but again, that's not strategy. Strategy is very concrete, it's very specific, it, it's really about the choices you make about how you're going to distinguish yourself and deliver that unique value uh, to the customer. And um, it, the, the clearer we are about where strategy fits, in the overall architecture of the things managers need to do, uh, the clearer will be about actually setting strategy well. So let's talk about you know, how we would think about creating a uh, really successful strategy. Well, the first thing we have to understand is uh, that the kind of core of all strategy is strategy at the level of an individual business. Uh, you know, some people call that business strategy. Um, now, there are many companies like General Electric 
uh, that compete in many different businesses. You know, General Electric makes locomotives, you know, for railroads, and they make wind turbines, and they make uh, uh, and they make uh, aircraft engines. Um, and, and, and there is an issue of strategy for a diversified group. Uh, we call that corporate level strategy. But business strategy is really the core uh, of all strategy because it's in the individual industry, in the individual marketplace where the dominant uh, determinants of whether a company win or lose uh, 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 actually occur. Um, so I'm going to be talking today almost uh, totally about business strategy, how to compete in a particular business with the understanding that some companies are in multiple businesses, they need a clear strategy for each of those businesses. Um, but for the, at, the, at the business level, um, we, we understand uh, uh, from uh, you know, all the work in this field that performance at the business level is really a function of two things. One is the business itself. Uh, because businesses actually differ in their inherent uh, attractiveness for a point of view of, of profitability. And that's what we call industry structure. Uh, every company competes in an industry, that industry has a structure. And that structure can make it harder or easier for the average company to be profitable and to improve that profitability over time. Uh, that's one part of kind of strategic thinking. The second part of strategic thinking is the positioning of the company within the industry, how that company uh, uh, kind of differs from its rivals. Uh, you think there about you know General Motors, you know versus Ford, you know versus uh, Toyota versus uh, BMW, um, uh, and and superior performance uh, in terms of excellent profitability and growth is affected by both of these things. It's affected by the inherent attractiveness of the industry. Uh, it's also affected by the, uh, the, the quality uh, and of the position that the company is able to occupy. Um, and we need to be careful to pull these things apart. We've got to understand what's driving success. Is it the industry issues that are really driving our profitability? Uh, is it the positioning issues? Or is it some combination of the two? We have to be able to kind of parse our understanding of the problem of competition and the problem of strategy into those uh, two very different buckets. Um, you know, you could be a, 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 have a great position in a lousy industry. You can have a mediocre position in a terrific industry. Uh, you've kind of got to understand where that performance is ultimately coming from. Um, so good strategic analysis includes industry analysis, and it also includes positioning, uh, uh, positioning analysis and positioning thinking. Now, on the industry side, um, um, you know, what we understand now is that when we look at an industry, the, the, the really way to look at an industry is to look at its fundamental structure. There are lots of things that are different about industries. The products are different. The manufacturing is different. The technology is different. Industries vary dramatically, and every industry is different. But every industry has a set of fundamental structural characteristics that we have to look at. And they're illustrated on this slide. This is the so-called five forces that some of you may have heard about. Um, and the five forces model says that what really drives profitability is these five things about an industry. The ultimate power of the customer to push down the price and drive down the profitability. The power of the suppliers of inputs, components, machines, services to raise their price and drive down the profitability of the industry. The, uh, the, whether there are substitute products or services around, uh, you know, whether there's plastic is going to affect uh, the profitability of aluminum. Uh, that's a substitute. Uh, the barriers to entry, how hard it is for new companies to actually get into that business. If it's easy, profits are going to be low. If it's really hard to get in the industry, that supports uh, a higher returns. And then finally, the nature of the rivalry uh, among the companies that are already in the industry. If rivalry is fierce and it's based on price, profitability is going to be low. If rivalry is perhaps based on features or service or image or brand, then that tends to support uh, higher levels of profitability. So in, uh, for any industry to understand the average level of profitability in the industry, uh, we have to really understand these fundamental structural forces. And industries like airlines that have horrendous profitability and have for decades, have horrendous profitability because they have a unattractive industry structure. You know, too easy for customers to switch, too much customer power, too much power of the airframe and engine manufacturers, 
too many alternatives to the air airplane and too much rivalry because the costs are fixed really make airlines a very unattractive industry very few airlines make money and they don't make it for very long it's 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 a very unattractive industry but for example business software is a very very attractive industry because the customer often gets locked in the cost of switching from one kind of software to another is almost impossible in many cases certainly on the business side you know the nature of the rivalry is much more attractive there are no substitute products the barriers to entry are very high because you have to spend you know tens of hundreds of billions of dollars to develop the software up front in order to play in the game so software is very profitable the average profitability is much higher in software than in airlines and that's not an accident that's not cyclical that's not a random that has to do with the underlying industry structure and so be doing good industry analysis is then critical to anybody developing a strategy to any of you uh, thinking about getting into a new business or starting a new venture you've got to understand the fundamental industry structure in which you want to play and how it might evolve over time so uh, that that then becomes one critical part of, of strategic analysis and strategic thinking uh, but today I'd like to focus more on the second part which is the positioning so so suppose you're going to compete in the airline industry or suppose you're going to compete in business software we know that the average is going to be different in terms of profitability but how can you be above average uh, in whatever industry you're competing in and, uh, and more importantly how can you avoid being below average uh, in terms of the profitability how do you achieve superiority in performance that is the fundamental positioning question and uh, to understand positioning we have to start at, at really the, a broad level and that is to understand why would a company be more profitable than its competitors and the answer to that is there's really only two ways you can be more profitable uh, than your competitor one is you can be able to command a higher price because you offer something that the customer is willing to pay more for and that's what we call differentiation differentiation um, and the second reason you might be more profitable is because you can produce an equivalent product or service at a lower inherent cost and so at the same price uh, you will be more profitable or even at a discounted price you're so efficient that you can be more profitable all superior performance comes from either getting a higher relative price or achieving a lower relative cost because of the choices you've made about how to compete about how to uh, configure uh, your your organization okay so uh, and, you know at, at the starting point of, of any strategic discussion is okay what are we trying to do here are we trying to be the differentiator uh, are we trying to be lower cost are we trying to do this uh, for many customers are we really trying to focus on a narrow segment of the market and be differentiated for that segment what is our fundamental overarching route to competitive advantage to superior profitability uh, that is really the first broad step in uh, strategic uh, thinking now in order to take that further we need now the concept of the value chain the value chain says that in any business in order to compete what that means is we have to perform a whole set of what we like to call activities 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 are things that a company does to actually uh, you know create the product design the product make the product provide service provide support after sale market the product um, the value chain is really a framework for seeing the firm as a set of activities uh, and the, and the headings in this value chain sort of these are a generic set of headings these are headings that are sort of general they apply to any business but of course every business is different so here you see a value chain for building houses and now once we focus on home building we can take the value chain idea and we can then sp specify it to that particular business so you know in 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 in, in development building houses we have to acquire the land somehow and then we have to actually make the how build the house and then we have to find customers and then we have to close the transaction and then we have to provide support over time uh you know uh, after after the sale uh, of the home and uh, uh and the top part of the value chain is the supporting activities uh, that allow us to uh, conduct the what we call the primary activities along the bottom uh, like uh, you know we got to do the procurement we got to purchase inputs all along the value chain we've got to bring it we have to hire people retain them train them so so again uh, uh, this is all hopefully intuitive to you just looking at this chart 
And the basic idea is that all competitive advantage and all great higher price and all lower cost comes from choices the company has made about how to configure the value chain, about how to do these things in the value chain. So if you have lower cost, it's because there's a number of things in the value chain where you figured out how to do it more efficiently. Uh, and if you have a higher price, uh, that's because there's certain things you've decided done in the value chain that allow you to deliver that greater value uh, that allows that customer to say, I, I'll pay a premium for that. And that could be in the design, that could be in the service, that could be in the branding, uh, that could be in a lot of different places. But the value chain allows us to get now really specific about where the competitive advantage comes from. Um, and that's why it's so important. You know, the old ideas about strategy were, you know, you looked at your strengths and your weaknesses and your opportunities and your threats. And that was a very broad, you know, quite a powerful way of thinking about, you know, how to think about how you were going to compete. But the value chain says, no, we got to get much deeper than that. We've got to really look at great detail at how we actually go to market, how we actually make the choices about how we're going to compete in the organization. That's where all competitive advantage comes from. This then becomes a critical tool in, in thinking about positioning. Now, then we, then, we, then we make a very fundamental distinction. And, and this is something that you know, all you know, great leaders understand. And that is, as we pursue competitive advantage, there's really two ways of doing that. Uh, one is to be more operationally effective. Um, and think of operational effectiveness as do the same thing better. Um, you know, uh, and think of operational effectiveness in terms of best practices. You know, there are best practices out there. They're being invented all the time. Operational effectiveness is just assimilating all the best practices, being up to date, having the most modern machines, having good up to date software, you know, understanding the latest thinking and how to motivate a sales force. Um, you know, using the internet, you know, to, you know, reach your customer. Those are all best practices. And part of success and part of advantage is operational effectiveness, continually raising the bar uh, on operational effectiveness. Indeed, this is about, you know, 90% of the job of any leader is operational improvement. Uh, you know, figuring out new ways of doing things better and, you know, making those happen within the organization. Um, that is critical to success. If you're not operationally effective, strategy doesn't matter. Uh, let me say that again. If you're not operationally effective, strategy doesn't matter uh, because you're going to give up too much cost and quality in the process of not being operationally effective. And you may have a great strategic positioning, but it's not going to matter because your competitors are going to eat your lunch. But the theory says that operational effectiveness, although a necessity, is not sufficient actually to achieve superior performance and particularly not for long. Because if it's a best practice for you, it's going to be a best practice for your competitor. And slowly but surely, your competitors are going to figure this stuff out. And if all you're doing is implementing the same best practices, it's very hard to be distinctive and, and unique and offer something different. Instead, if all you're doing is implementing the same best practices, we have something that I like to call strategic convergence. Everybody starts looking the same. And where all the companies look the same and are offering pretty much the same products with pretty much the same features, with pretty much the same services, then what happens is competition has to gravitate to price. And price starts going down. Uh, you know, the worst mistake in strategy is to get into a competition on the same thing. If your competitor is competing on after-sales support, the last thing you want to do is compete on after-sales support. You want to find another way of competing to deliver unique value to companies that care about that. Uh, and if all you're doing is thinking about the world in terms of best practices and uh, operational improvement, uh, you fall into that trap uh, of, 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 you know, you get better, uh, but you're not, you're not profitable. Uh, you're not actually winning. Uh, you're, 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 rushing to stay, you're rushing to stay uh, in the game. Um, and um, very few sustainable competitive advantages come from operational effectiveness. Uh, most of them come actually from strategic positioning. That's different. Strategic positioning kind of presumes that you're operational effective. But strategic positioning is all about making choices. Choices. Operational effectiveness is just about executing best practice. There's no choice there. Uh, strategy is about making choices about how you're going to be different 
not doing the same thing better, but choosing to be different in order to meet a different need of a set of customers that you've chosen to serve than your rivals. That's the fundamental distinction between operational effectiveness and strategic positioning. Both are critically important, but what we found is that, that it's the strategic positioning part that often gets overlooked or, 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 or under, under uh, focused on. Um, and companies just find themselves caught in a game that they can't win because they're just implementing the same best practices that everybody else is, is implementing. And they're just copying what they see other people doing rather than actually making choices about how to be different, how to be unique. Okay. Now, in order to then develop a robust strategic positioning, we, we now, I think, understand that there's some basic attributes of a successful strategy. And so let me very quickly kind of cover those attributes. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, uh, uh, you know, how to get there. And then a little bit about how this can be kind of uh, uh, ported into the world of nonprofits. First attribute of a winning strategy is the organization must have a unique value proposition. You've got to offer something different to the customers you're choosing to serve than your competitors. That, that's kind of step number one. If you're trying to be better at producing the same product with the same manufacturing, with the same service to the same customers at the same price, you don't have a strategy. You, you know, you're competing on operational effectiveness. Uh, now, what's a value proposition? A value proposition is the answer to three basic questions. Uh, one, uh, what customers? Uh, what set of customers are you choosing to serve? Uh, that's a critical question that every strategy has to answer. Uh, now, you know, the typical default answer is, well, let's serve everybody. You know, anybody who wants it, you know, can come. Well, that, that's not strategy. That's 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 the slippery slope to mediocrity. Uh, a strategist uh, has to understand what customers you actually want to serve. Uh, and then the next question is, what needs of those customers are we particularly going to try to meet uh, uniquely well? Uh, that's that that's the second question. And then at what price? Are we going to ask for a premium? Are we going to offer a, you know parity? Are we going to see make uh, offer a discount? because we found a way to be really, really efficient in meeting the needs of who we want to serve. Uh, those are the three questions that constitute a value proposition. And um, the, 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 the key principle of strategy is your answers have to be different than the competitors. You know, if you're, if you're serving the same customers and meeting the same needs at the same price, you don't have a strategy, you're just competing on who can do the same thing better. That's operational effectiveness. That's a hard game to win. Uh, particularly if your competitors are not idiots, you know, if they're not brain dead, you know, you, you, it's a hard game to win. Uh, but but strategy says, you know, we don't we don't compete head to head. We 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 compete to be unique. Uh, now let's let's take an example of that. Uh, this is a company that I know very very well, I IKEA, uh, and you all probably know it well because many of you sitting in that room are are part of their target customer group. Uh, you know, what's their value proposition? Well, um, they don't look like Ethan Allen. They, they, they don't look like a lot of the other furniture stores, furniture retailers. Um, uh, they, and, and, and the starting point is really who they're trying to serve. Um, and you see on the slide, um, you know, they, they're trying to serve people who really appreciate design, who appreciate, you know, products that are good quality and decent materials. Uh, but they, they're, they want, they're serving customers who actually want to get that at a very low price point, a very low price point. Um, and, uh, in order to, uh, to do that, they're going to, they're going to actually meet quite a large set of the needs of those target customers. Uh, they have a wide line of furniture and accessories for, you know, every room in the house, they have collections. Uh, so they're going to try to meet a lot of needs of those particular uh, group of customers. Um, and, um, and, and we'll kind of get a little bit into that later on. So basically, IKEA is, is, has made a choice about who we are trying to serve. Um, and, um, and, and that is the starting point for strategy and how we are going to de de define value for those customers in our own unique way. Okay. 
Um, and, you know, I know this company very, very well because uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Lana, um, went to University of Pennsylvania. And, and virtually every time that I went down to Philadelphia, which was once every six weeks or so, you know, she would often call ahead and say, Dad, could you rent an SUV uh, when you come down? You know, and, and I would say, well, of course, uh, but, you know, why do you want that? And she'd say, well, you know, I want to go to ICANN. I want to go to ICANN. Uh, and so we would, you know, so I, I got to know, I got to know this organization very well. And, and it was clear that, that all, often great strategies don't involve sort of traditional segmentation schemes of the industry. You know, I can't customers are not old or young, although they're a little bit skewed to young, but they're quite, they're not, they're not rich or, or, or poor. They tend not to be super rich, but they a wide variety of incomes, but they're people who are unified in a certain set of needs. Uh, compact, space efficient, uh, furnishings, you know, style and design, um, but but at, at, a, at a very low price. And, um, um, and uh, you know, that's the starting point for strategy. You know, who do you really want to serve and what set of their needs are we going to actually try to meet uh, with our uh, strategy? Now, that leads then to the second attribute of a successful strategy, and that is you got to have a different value chain. You can't be conducting the business in the same way. You know, if you have the you know, same product development, the same manufacturing, the same supply chain, the same customer support, the same kind of marketing, you don't have a strategy. You can have the greatest slogan in the world about your value proposition, but unless the value chain allows you to be uniquely good at delivering that value proposition, then the strategy is kind of all hot air. Um, uh, so if, if we go back to Ikea, we see the, all the choices they've made in the value chain. Um, and, and the key, you know, uh, thing that they figured out was the, the whole modular concept. That is that if you design furniture so that it was easy to assemble and disassemble, you could, you could ship both inbound logistics, but also get to the customer, you could, you could actually uh, move the customer, the product around in a box of the pieces of the furniture, rather than have to ship couches and, you know, and bedroom sets around, which are bulky and expensive to ship. Um, and uh, it's that modular concept that was one of the key choices they made uh, about how they were going to configure their value chain. But there was a whole lot of other choices. Uh, you know, IKEA has these huge stores. Everything that IKEA has is in the store. There's no choices. There's no options. There's no customization. Uh, basically, it's there. Uh, it's in the store. It's sitting there. You can look at it. Um, there's virtually very low in-store service. I mean, if you go to IKEA and there's somebody that has an IKEA, you know, shirt on that says IKEA and you look in their direction, they usually turn around and run in the other direction. They don't want to help you. That's that's not their strategy. they they, they, their products are well described on the internet. They're well described in the store in terms of the basic facts and figures. There's no customization. Uh, they don't want to spend the money to have an in-store person, you know, uh, talking to you and coaching you. That's that's not part of their strategy. Their customer, their value proposition. That isn't what it's all about. Um, you can see the other choices. Uh, uh, you, at IKEA, you can't buy a piece of furniture. All you can buy is a box. And uh, then you and then then you know dad has to back his SUV up and you have to put the box in and then daughter and dad get the you know schlep the box up the stairs you know into her dorm room and then we get to have a you know pre Christmas experience you know putting together the furniture in, into parts and that's that's their that's their value chain uh, that's the choices they've made um, and that's very appealing to my daughter Lana because. Uh, she gets the terrific stuff that's cool and appeals to her design sensibilities, uh, but she gets it at a really low price point. And she's willing to do all that stuff. I mean, she doesn't need to have a salesperson. She doesn't need to have somebody show up with a moving van, you know, to put the, put the furniture in her, in her dorm room or her apartment. Um, the value chain is aligned with the value proposition. And that then becomes the second part of a really great strategy. Uh, the third part is the concept of trade-offs. Uh, all great strategies involve making trade-offs. A trade-off is where to do one thing really well, you deliberately choose not to do other things. Uh, and I like to say that the real test of a strategy is whether you've chosen not to do things. 
not not what you've chosen to do but also but also what you've chosen not to do you know what needs do you not serve what customers will you not try to you know please um that is essential to all great strategies uh, ikea is a great example I, I can tell you right now with no disrespect to the company i hate ikea i don't like it every minute i'm there i'm unhappy and uncomfortable i would never shop there i would never buy that product I'm not interested in putting together the furniture. I'm not interested in taking my SUV and getting it. I'm not interested in any of that. Uh, my daughter loves it. I hate it. And one of the very interesting things about strategy, and if you can remember you know, one or two things from this talk, remember this. Part of strategy is the willingness to make customers unhappy. If you're going to have a successful strategy, you can't try to make everybody happy. You've got to make some customers insanely happy, but other customers, you just have to be cool with the idea that you're not meeting their needs, you know, and you're not serving whatever, you know, needs they have. So, you know, uh, if I filled out a, a customer comment card after an IKEA visit, you know, I would give them, you know, bottom ratings for everything. But IKEA needs to look at my customer comment card and say, up. Oh, we don't care. That's not our. That's not who we're trying to serve. But in a world where we have all these slogans like "you need to please your customer and delight your customer," companies get totally wrapped around the axle here. They they think that their job is to make everybody happy, and if somebody com gives them a complaint, they should be very attentive to that. Well, ha most of the complaints you get are for people that you're not trying to serve, and they've stumbled into your store. Uh, and you and you have to ignore those. But if one of your target customers gives you some negative feedback, boy, we rivet our attention on that. So you can see the nuance of strategy, um, and you can see how subtle it is, and how you can get uh, you know, really confused about what what the strategy thing is all about. Um, uh, trade offs become critical. Pleasing every customer is a disaster. Um, you know, trying to have it all and offer every service and meet every need is, is, is doomed to failure. A strategy is fundamentally about trade-offs. Uh, and then this slide just, you know, catalogs some of the IKEA's uh, trade-offs that, that, that you're well aware of. I mean, if you want, if you want special custom varieties, then, you know, IKEA just says, well, I understand that, but we don't do that. We don't do that. Uh, and, uh, and, and essentially it's the what we don't do stuff that really helps lift IKEA to the level of extraordinary performance. Never ever imitate it. Uh, because it's very hard to copy IKEA uh, if you're another company without uh, ultimately eroding whatever uh, advantages you've had in your organization. Uh, and uh, ultimately their advantage has been very, very sustainable. Lots of strategies have sustainable advantages. Uh, there's some people in, 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 in the field of management thinking that believe that no advantage can be sustained. And that's complete and utter BS. Most great companies sustain their advantages for decades. Everybody's known IKEA's strategy now for 30 years. All you have to do is walk into the store, you can see exactly what their strategy is. Nobody's been able to imitate them. Same with Apple, the same with countless other companies. And that's because strategy is essentially about making choices, making trade-offs, and as we'll see later, tying those choices together into a, um, a, uh, a coherent whole. Uh, you know, fourth uh, characteristic of a great strategy is fit. It's, it's connecting the activities in the value chain. Uh, it, it's making the way you do one activity uh, uh, leverage the way you do another activity. And uh, this is... Uh, uh, what we call a, an activity system. This is the IKEA case, and this starts to help to see how the activities at IKEA are mutually reinforcing and, and how the, the way they do design affects the way they do production, and the way they do production affects the way they do logistics, and the way they do logistics affects the way they run their stores, and the way they run their stores affects the way they do design, and it, it, it all it's all mutually reinforcing. So to copy IKEA, you can't just copy a feature. You have to copy everything. Because it's really the whole that produces the advantage. It's not the individual choices. They reinforce. Uh, and again, this is another reason why uh, really good strategies are almost impossible to imitate. You don't just have to imitate one thing. You have to imitate everything. And the company you're imitating has been doing it for a long time. And, and, and you have it. You know? So it's really, really hard uh, for a coherent, well-thought-out strategy to be imitated. Uh, it's easy to copy a product feature. 
so if that's what you think your strategy is, i have this better feature, well, that's not going to work. that's not going to work um and the final um ah attribute of a of a sound strategy is continuity. um you know, in this in this world of change, um you know, we tend to get caught in the trap that we need to be changing the company all the time and that is true in only one sense and that is we've got to be continuously improving operational effectiveness. We've got to continually find better ways of doing things and and we have to continually find better ways of implementing our strategy and 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 delivering that value proposition better and making those trade-offs more clear and 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 sharper. So change is continuous but not change in strategy. Not change in the basic value proposition. Because if you if you start flopping around on your basic value proposition, there is no way that you'll ever be successful. Because first of all, you won't be good at it. You know, if you're trying to get your organization to deliver low cost one year and then be differentiated the next year, you'll never get good at it. People will just their heads will spin. Your your employees won't know what to do. Your customer won't understand who you are and and what you're trying to offer. You know, your suppliers won't know how to support you. So strategy requires continuity and that means that all strategy is essentially a bet. Because you got to stick with it for, you know, 2 3 4 years to make to see for it to have the opportunity to be really successful. And uh uh and 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 a lot of people get caught into this trap of agility, you know, and flexibility. Well, don't get caught, you know, because just by being agile, you know, that might make you less bad, but you're not going to be uniquely good. uh unless you're willing to make a commitment to a direction uh, and hopefully you make a commitment to an enduring value proposition where some technological trend doesn't invalidate it you know in a year uh but though but that's the price of a great strategy is is continuity and, and sticking with it and getting your organization to understand it better and having everybody in the organization able to actually describe you know who are we what's what's different about us really all the way down to the sales force and and the service department and and all the all the particularly the customer facing but even the people that are hidden from the customer you know what kind of products should we be developing in our product development organization well in order to answer that question we got to understand the strategy you know who are we how are we trying to be unique um and 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 what we find is that these five areas if we can get these things you know right then there's a good chance uh that we can actually uh be superior uh and that we can actually sustain that uh, over time. Uh you know at some level back to the earlier slides uh what we do, what we're trying to do with strategy is avoid a zero sum competition. Where uh we're all trying to meet the same needs and if 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 I win that means that somebody else lost. Uh what we want to do instead is really create a positive sum competition where we where we where companies meet different groups of needs hopefully uniquely well uh and that actually allows multiple organizations to be successful uh it also tends to expand the market because we we can serve more needs and we can serve more needs better and that means that more people get to be served um and there's this kind of simple minded view of competition which I I uh, that we we study in you know economics 101 uh, which is that all companies are the same and they offer the same products and services and they're kind of homogeneous and the only way to win is you know to be the lowest cost producer and and that's that's fine in 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 you know like one industry out of a thousand you know if you if you're but but even in a commodity industry it doesn't work that way you know you could be a coal company producing coal but it turns out that you know you don't have to differentiate yourself just on the coal it's also your logistical system and your delivery and you know there's lots of ways to distinguish yourself when you see the organization as a complex value chain with lots of opportunities for choices and we got to get away from the simplistic view that the only that it's all head to head in fact that's the opposite of what it really is in order to achieve success now you know i won't dwell on this slide but you know what i find even to this day uh is that there's a lot of organizations that just don't have sound strategic thinking. Uh they just don't get it, you know, and uh that's because I think uh, although it's quite widely uh, understood now and taught in business schools, uh you know, there's there, there's you know, there's still a long way to go before uh everybody kind of understands these basic concepts. And so a lot of organizations don't have a strategy at all. They just they just 
sort of rumbling along, trying to get better every day and imitating what the other guys are doing and getting into every new segment of the market that they see pop up. And, you know, any, any customer that shows up, they say, of course, you know, we'll serve you, you know, we'll meet your need and don't never turn down an order. Um, you know, there's a lot of organizations that do that because it's, you know, a part of it is misunderstanding. Part of it is your customers sometimes ask you for things and you should say no. <laughs> rather than to contort your organization to do something that you're not, you know, and, uh, you know, in organizations, there's this kind of Pollyannish view that our whole team should all agree on the strategy. And therefore, if somebody doesn't agree, then we should compromise and give them a little bit of what they want and a little bit of what I want, and a little bit of what you want. And, you know, strategy by consensus is never good strategy. Strategy is about making exquisitely clear choices. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're not going to do. Here's what our value is. Here's what our value is not. Here's how we're different. Uh, it's not a compromise. It, it's, it's clarity. And then you can have debate and discussion to come up with the strategy, but then the debate has to stop and, it, and the discussion has to be about how can we do this really, really well. And then maybe, you know, someday, or heaven forbid, we're going to have to review whether the strategy is still viable. But except for that discussion, we can't have that discussion all the time. And uh, one of the big mistakes that CEOs make is they tolerate uh, doubters in their team who are constantly whining, you know, about the strategy rather than kind of pulling the organization together. So, uh, you know, if this if you get into a situation where you're building a, a new venture or a business and, and you've got somebody who just can't get on board uh, and they've made their case and you've all thought about it and you've all agreed, no, this is where we're going to go, that person just has to leave. It's as simple as that. Uh, and this is something, again, that, that we, we sometimes see leaders uh, not willing to do. Uh, capital markets uh, don't make strategy particularly easy. They're very short term. They're very focused on, you know, comparing you against everybody else, against common metrics, which tends to force you to look like your competitors if you want to score well on the Wall Street metrics. And so uh, a lot of things that really get in the way of strategy. That's why I'd say, you know, I'd say less than half of all companies really have a clear strategy, maybe less than 25%. Uh, you know, I'd never done a study on this, but my own example from my own experience is that, that a lot of organizations get defeated by these things. They don't get it. They can't do it. Uh, they get distracted from it. Um, and uh, they don't have a clear strategy. Now, uh, let's turn very briefly to uh, social enterprise or nonprofits, because I suspect that some fraction of you are going to be in that world uh, and have aspirations in that area. You know, how do we make the, 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 the mapping between the for-profit and, and, and the nonprofit? Well, I think the, the way we do that is we understand that, you know, m almost all nonprofits uh, have a customer. And we have to figure out who that customer really is and learn to think of who we're delivering services to as a customer. Um, and then all, most all nonprofits are delivering some kind of service, and we have to start understanding what exactly is our service. You know, what's our product uh, that we're delivering to our customer? And that customer, that may be a homeless person, that may be a, uh, uh, a, 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 public, a public school, it could be all kinds of different customers and, and our products could you know, be very different, but we have to figure out what we actually offer in terms of services. And uh, you know, a, a very important point is your funder is not your customer. It's actually the customer is the customer and the funder is the funder. And uh, I put this point on there because one of the greatest reasons why nonprofits fail and don't really make any difference in the world is they don't get this point. Rather than figure out who their real customer is and deliver something excellent to that customer, they do what the, they can get funded. And if another funder comes along and wants them to do something a little bit different, they, then they do that. And most nonprofits have horrendous strategic thinking because all they're pulled in 17 different directions by each of their funders who thinks they have the right to dictate you know, what the organization does, uh, rather than the organization making that choice and then letting the funder decide whether they want to play or whether they don't want to play. So uh, this is a very fundamental point in, in the world of nonprofits. Uh, now, uh, the, the second really critical thing about nonprofits is we've got to start understanding what the goal is. In, in for-profit businesses, the goal is easy. You know, it's kind of set for you. It's profitability, superior profitability. 
And that kind of unites everybody on what the fundamental purpose is. In, in a nonprofit, profitability obviously is not the goal. Uh, so in a nonprofit, you've got to think of the goal uh, as, as value, uh, some kind of social value or societal value that you're trying to deliver. Um, and your goal is not profitability, but your goal is to deliver the highest value you can to the set of customers that you're trying to serve. Um, and um, so in order to define the value you're trying to deliver, once again, we have to figure out to who. Um, and then, and then we got to find ways of defining value and our outcomes in a way that's measurable so that we can actually tell whether we're succeeding. Um, so, you know, uh, when you're, when you're, when you're an art museum, uh, you know, what's your goal? Well, uh, you're, you know, some kind of societal value. Well, there's actually a lot of goals for an art museum that you could set. You could be in the business of collecting and preserving art for you know, posterity. Uh, you could be seeing your goal as educational. Uh, you could see your goal as entertainment. Uh, God forbid uh, people in the field rankle at that, but a lot of this is really entertainment. Uh, so what is actually your goal? And depending on what your goal or goals are, you can have more than one goal in a nonprofit. Uh, you need to figure out how would I measure that? Um, and so you need the equivalent of profitability in order to, to really be clear about excellence in any organization. And, and that's a little bit different in, in the world of a nonprofit. Um, again, you can use the same concept of the value chain to really describe you know, what you do. And uh, this is a value chain for a, a museum. Um, I once had the privilege of, of talking to all the museum directors from across America about you know, this, this topic. And, um, and, and so we, we, we drew this up just to give them an idea of, you know, wait a minute, you can think about the world this way too. And, you know, and, and, and you can read this, uh, uh, this chart and see that, you know, museums have a value chain. They do stuff. And there are choices they have to make about how to exhibit and, and, and what kind of hospitality services to provide along with the whatever it is, the art or the culture or whatever they're doing. And, uh, and those are all choices. And different organizations can make different choices depending on who they're trying to serve and, and, and which needs they're trying to meet. And, and the same basic... Uh, kind of analytical thinking process ap applies in the world of, of nonprofits. Um, and, you know, it's particularly hard to develop strategy in the world of nonprofits. Uh, and this is just, you know, the, the most common things I see, you know, uh, for, for doing that. Uh, like, you know, nobody's ever really thought of what the goal are. And if they do, they all have conflicting goals because, you know, the staff all have different passions and they want to do different things. And, and the board members who think they are able to choose because they gave money, you know, they have different goals. And the end is uh, this kind of uh, hodgepodge of, of programs. Uh, funders drive us uh, towards uh, a lack of strategy and, and, and so on. Okay, so uh, I think that, that those of you that want to go in the world of nonprofits, if you can actually understand this stuff, you will be indispensable. Because this is a world where we're not delivering value. I'd say, I'd say, only one out of 10 nonprofits actually delivers real significant high value. We have a lot of things that are small, fragmented, you know, don't really have impact, not clear, too many different programs, different directions. And the nonprofit world is, is, is ready for epic uh, improvement. And uh, it's very hard for these reasons. But if you can get this stuff uh, in, in one of these organizations and really help uh, take an organization in this direction, uh, you'll be uh, truly uh, indispensable. Let me just conclude with, with one final slide and, and then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A. Um, and that's the role of leadership. And um, what, I've, what I've found is, is that, uh, you know, strategy is the ultimate job of leadership. Uh, strategy is the ultimate thing that only the leader can ultimately oversee and, uh, and make those critical choices. Because the leader is the one who has this perspective of the whole. The person in charge of marketing is worrying about marketing. The person talking about service is worried about service. And they look at the world from their discipline. But, but the, the, the leader, the CEO, the general manager is the one who can actually see the whole, the easiest. Um, and uh, therefore, you know, ultimately, the leader has to be the architect of strategy and, and, and make the choice at the end of the day, with a lot of participation uh, uh, by the team. Um, you know, leaders have to communicate the strategy. You know, having a strategy written down and put in a safe and kept secret 
defies the very purpose of strategy the purpose of strategy is alignment it's to get everybody in the organization to figure out what they're supposed to do in their role to advance the company and you know with a with a clear strategy people make those choices well but without a strategy the leader has to run around and second guess and teach everybody tell everybody what to do and that's just impossible so strategy is your critical alignment tool to make sure everybody's you know rowing in sync and and on the right river you know heading to the right place so that at the end of the day you'll truly be unique and so leadership is about choosing strategy but it's also about communicating it's also about enforcing the strategy avoiding distraction avoiding imitation avoiding you know trying to please people that we shouldn't try to please and and that is what great leaders do they really keep the organization on point on focus on direction um, and, um, and, and, and help the organization uh, move ahead. Um, I can tell you, any organization that has a clear strategy, it gives you a tremendous boost of energy. People want to be part of something different. They want to be distinctive. They want to be part of an organization that's changing the world in some sense of that word. And, and, and having a clear strategy rather than just kind of copying what everybody else is doing is, is really a powerful force there. So um, uh, let, me, let me stop there uh, and hope that this has given you some of the the key ideas that let me turn it over to Buck or, or, or Holden uh, to kind of manage the, the, the 15 minutes or so we have remaining. Thank you. Great. Mike, thank you so much. It's fabulous. So we do have some um, for students to uh, submit questions for the laptops and must probably start for one, but we'll kick it off for uh, some of those questions begin and ask you one of the places you spend some time is with the Cleveland Clinic. And obviously healthcare is one of the huge issues facing the country right now. So could you just briefly talk a little bit about the um, strategy that the Cleveland Clinic developed and its impact on how you think about healthcare? Uh, Buck, you were breaking up a little bit, but I think the question was about healthcare and strategy in healthcare. Uh, and let me, let me, yeah, okay. Um, okay. Uh, specifically, the Cleveland Clinic. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. Good. Well, I, again, I think that the healthcare uh, is an example of, of, of the, the starting point for, I think, understanding healthcare, healthcare strategy is to think about what is the goal of healthcare. And um, the goal of healthcare, uh, in, in our way of looking at the world, is to deliver superior value to the patient. And value is the outcomes that the patient achieves for whatever medical problem they have uh, related to how much it costs us to actually deliver those outcomes. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, from there, we then have to uh, ask ourselves, well, how would we configure a strategy for a delivery organization to actually deliver the maximum value uh, for the patient for a particular medical problem? And uh, there's a whole, you know, framework that, 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 that grows out of that and a whole set of choices that delivery organizations need to make. The Cleveland Clinic is a wonderful case because they very much are a value-based organization. Uh, they measure outcomes uh, all across the organization and they reorganize their care delivery process around the patient's needs rather than in the traditional model of medical specialties. So instead of the patient having to go from one specialist to another, uh, they put the specialist for dealing with, uh, you know, uh, cancer in the same organization and the patient then is served by a team uh, that is uh, that is responsible for delivering the best outcomes and doing it the most efficiently. So that's kind of a very high level view. There's a series of articles and, and a book about this. And anybody in the room that's interested in healthcare, uh, we'd be happy to send you some references. It's a vitally important topic. We have not had a solution to this problem, but I think we've now started to see how to go forward here. Great, thanks. Another question comes: uh, Could you give a specific example about some nonprofit? Uh, organizations and how they've uh, adopted or strategic thinking or some of your strategy. We have a lot of people interested in nonprofit here. Mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, I, we have left depth of uh, case studies, uh, certainly in my group on, on nonprofits, and, and I'm sure that uh, we have a course, we have courses and curriculum on, on social enterprise at HBS, and uh, all of them talk about strategy, uh, and I'm sure there's great cases. I mean, just, um, um, uh, you know, an, an interesting example that comes to mind, given some other work I've done, is an organization called TechnoServe. Uh, that has started to understand that, that they're really focused on um, dealing with small producers in developing countries, you know, small farmers and other small producers, and how can we improve the, 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 the lives of those, of those producers. And they've started to understand that, that what really fundamentally defines value for what they do is, you know, can they really uh, boost the actual I incomes, sustainable incomes of, their, of, the, uh, of the populations that they're setting out to serve? And... And, and can they do that at, 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 with reasonable efficiency? And, uh, and, they, and they've developed, of course, a lot of skills in, in working with small farmers and helping them improve their yields and improve their quality and, and improve the supporting infrastructure. Uh, and they, and, they, and they, they really are one of the pioneers in the nonprofit world of understanding that, yes, there's a lot they can do as a nonprofit, but what if they teamed up with for-profit companies? Uh, like Unilever or like Nestle that were doing procurement in uh, from small farmers in rural areas. And, 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 and so Nestle, uh, so TechnoServe now works very, very tightly connected to the leading kind of agricultural uh, uh, procurement companies and food companies in the world to actually deliver these services. So they can really multiply uh, the value that they can deliver because they can then engage the Nestle's of this world in, in providing financing and and, and helping uh, sort of guarantee purchasing based on certain quality specifications, and that allows uh, all kinds of other good things to happen. So I think TechnoServe would be would be a wonderful example. It's not just a bunch of, you know, people going out and trying to do good. You know, they thought very very deeply about, you know, okay, what what is the value equation for that organization? Who is their real customer? In their case, it's these small farmers in in rural communities. Uh, and then how can they best configure themselves to deliver value, uh, both in terms of their staff, but also the kind of uh, partnerships they develop uh, in order to kind of multiply and leverage and scale uh, the impact they have. So that would be one example, Buck. Great. One last question. Uh, looks like a fat pitch. Somebody, Jim Collins in Good to Great says, a great company is simply a function of good leaders choosing great people and strategy will follow. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, um, I, I think you know I, Jim has <laughs> done great work, but but Jim's work is more about internal organization and how you motivate people and and how you get people you know inspired and engaged and um, and of course that's really really important. But uh, but I think uh, you know ultimately. Uh, the strategy doesn't really take care of itself. Uh, it, it's really hard to have a strategy. And, uh, you know, Apple is, is great not because of internal things that happen, because, you know, Steve Jobs had a very clear sort of almost rebellious idea of what a, that company was going to be. And it had a lot of choices like, you know, design and higher price and, uh, and, 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 a, and a certain kind of functionality and, and, a, and, a, and a willingness to kind of give up the con con conventional uh, co uh, concept of certain product categories. And, uh, uh, and, and that was fundamentally, I mean, yes, some of those ideas, you know, came up from, from below, but it wasn't just an inchoate set of ideas. It was a coherent view of how Apple was going to distinguish itself in the marketplace. And, and, and that's not to say it's the only way to compete in their business. There are other companies that deliver great value doing something totally different. But uh, ultimately, I, I don't think we can, we, we can rely on you know, just motivated people uh, coming up with strategy. If, if we're not careful, motivated people will make it even harder to have a strategy because everybody will be so excited they'll want to do the things that they're passionate about. And um, so the key is getting alignment, and I think that's where Jim is really under under uh, under uh, valuing the need for uh, a, a, a leadership team to really define the fundamental direction and purpose um, and then hopefully motivate the people and attract them around that purpose. Wonderful. So... Mike and I were talking right a uh, day or two ago, and he said maybe he could come down in the spring around the time of the Carolina Duke game. And uh, Mike, we have the athletic director sitting in the front row here. So um, I'll 